everyone. This is a theoretical astrophysics lecture course. We are going to study the stellar structure and evolutions. First topic is the equations of stellar evolutions. And the second topic, we study the physics to describe the evolution of stars. And the third topic is the equilibrium, stellar structures. And the fourth topic, we discuss the stability of stars. And the fifth topic is the main sequence stars. Majority of stars belong to the main sequence stars. Then we are going to discuss the evolution of stars. And finally, the end stage stellar evolutions. Stardust. The first topic, we are going to study the equations of stellar evolutions today. First topic is the stellar evolutions. Second topic, we use some assumptions to describe the stellar evolutions. So I'd like to explain the, what kind of the assumptions we are going to use. And the third topic, the equations. Basic equations to describe the stellar evolutions. And the fourth topic, I'd like to introduce the important theorems, Villiers theorems. And the fifth topic, we estimate some characteristic time scale for the stellar evolution. First topic is the stellar evolution. In the previous lectures, we studied the HR diagrams. In the HR diagrams, vertical line is a luminosity, logarithmic scale of the luminosity. A horizontal line is a temperature, surface temperature of stars. And the giant is located upper right corners. And the white dwarf is located in the lower left corners. Majority of the stars belong to the main sequence located in, in the middle. So there are three types of the stars. Giant, main sequence, white dwarf. We'd like to find the relation between the, these three types of stars. First topic is the information of stars. Information is confined to a brief moment in the star's life. Galileo Galilei developed a telescope, started to observe stars 400 years ago. So compared with the star's life, 10 billion years. So if you make a ratio, our observation times is a 400 years, over the 10 billion years, a star's life. It becomes a 4 times 10 to minus 8. This is the number. It's really, really small. So if you consider this ratio, for example, for human life, this time period can be calculated. X over the human life is a 4 times 10 to minus 8. For human life, if you consider that 8 years, this is the average lifetime for human being is 80 years. Then you can calculate the x by converting the year to the second. So one year is about 30 million seconds. Then you can calculate. It's about 90 seconds. It's about 1 minute 30 seconds. So how can we understand other people in 90 seconds? Sounds, it is almost impossible in our daily experience. So if you see the, some other people and the 90 seconds later, you understand other people. It's quite difficult. So how astronomers find out the evolution of stars? Actually, astronomers are so clever. They observe not only the single stars, they observe a number of stars and they discover. 
three types of stars actually exist. Also, you could, we could observe the, a number of people, number of human beings. Sometimes uh, like a baby, or sometimes most of the people belong to the, this. And then also some old people has a problem in leg, then they start using cane. Once you observe the, a number of people, so if you think that you are visitors from the other planet, and observe the number of the people in a very short time period, like a 90 seconds, and then how could understand human beings on the earth? There are two interpretations. First one is that humans are intrinsically different. This is the first interpretation. And the second interpretation is that humans are similar to one another, but their properties change in the course of their lives. So, first interpretation, there are three types of the human beings exist. And the second interpretation, a human is changing. So we know that, we understand this second interpretation is correct. But how could, how the astronomers could say that second interpretation is correct? If you observe the number of human beings, actually in these situations, always a baby crawls on the ground or floors, and the adult walk with the two legs. And if you observe the number of babies, you happen to observe the transitions. So babies start walking with the two legs. Then you happen to observe the such a babies. Then we understand the second interpretation is correct ones. We could interpret the history of the stars. Okay, so now we'd like to explain the assumptions when we study the evolution of stars. So if we, you find out the closest star to our suns, closest star is Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is located 4.3 light years away from us. So if we compare with the distance to the Alpha Centauri, it's 4.3 light years, the distance is R. And to R, this means the diameter of the suns. If you consider the ratio of the distance to the diameters of the suns, it becomes a 3 times 10 to 7, 30 million. So if you consider that this is in our case, so X is the distance to the neighbors, to your neighbors. And your height, I assume the 1.7 meters. Then, how far is your neighbors? Actually, he or she lives in the 50,000 kilometers away. So if you consider the circumference of the Earth is 40,000 kilometers, so your neighbor cannot live on the Earth. Right? So if you live here, longest distance you could consider is uh, 2,000 kilometers. Longer than this length. So stars are so isolated. So when you consider the evolution of stars, we don't have to consider the neighbor stars. Only we consider single stars. Okay. The second assumption is a uniform initial composition. We are going to assume. Composition of the interstellar medium, a medium between the stars, is very similar to the solar abundance. And most stars have the similar composition with the solar compositions. So we assume the same composition with the solar abundance. 
as the initial composition of stars. All the stars have the same composition with our sun. And another assumption is the spherical symmetries. So we know the sun is spinning. Sun is rotating around the spinning axis. So if the spinning motion is really hard, so how could we discover that actually the sun is spinning? Because if we, we observe the sunspot is a dark place on the surface of the sun, this sunspot is moving from the left to the right. Then we realize actually the sun is spinning. So depending on the angular velocity of our stars, if the angular velocity is really small, shape of the star is like a sphere. But if we consider really large angular velocities, then shape becomes changing from the spheres. It's an elliptical shape we could observe. We have to consider the angular velocity of the sun. So 2 pi is a 2 pi radians divided by the period of the sun is a 27 days. Then spinning angular velocity is becomes 3 times 10 to minus 6 per second. Then ratios of the centrifugal force to the gravity. Centrifugal force is given by the R omega squares. So omega, you can substitute. R is the radius of the sun. And the gravity is a gm m sub sun over R is a radius squares. Then you could compare the two forces acting on the object, really small ob object on the surface of the sun. Then it becomes a 2 times 10 to minus 5. So this number is really, really small. So centrifugal force is much, much weaker than the gravity. We could use uh, these light figures to describe the shape of our sun. So from the, this, we consider the shape of the sun is a sphere. So usually to describe the quantities in the 3Ds, some quantities of the F is a function of X, Y, Z because of 3D. Or if you use a spherical coordinate, R, theta, phi. But we could use a spherical symmetrical assumptions then all the functions, physical quantity, becomes a just only the function of R. R is a distance from the centers. Okay, this is the end of this session.